So you should have watched the movie or the movie, the play pause it on moles. So you get a little bit of a concept idea behind what's going on with it. And we want to kind of ease into that. And so we'll do some repetitive stuff. Before we get there, we have to have some kind of a foundation behind it. So what we're going to do is stick with what formulas mean. Okay? So if I want to build this wheel, I need the spokes, and I need a rim, fish, I need a tire, all of that. What would our formula for the wheel be? What might we go through and do? If I was going to build this. Wheel plus spokes plus twisty thing in the middle. Well, what is the wheel built out of, though? Rubber. That's the tire. Metal. The wheel is that whole thing, right? So I could go through and say, well, the wheel is WH. Keep things simple. How do I build that wheel? Well, that wheel is built with a rim. Okay. What else is in that wheel? I've got spokes. Okay. I've got a tire. Okay. If we drop in some bowels, we can get a little respect. <laughs> Sorry, it just looks like that. That was unintentional. Um, so we might not go through and use the symbol WH anymore because we want to reference those pieces because those pieces could be used somewhere else. Okay, same kind of thing happens in chemistry. We came up with symbols for our most simple basic pieces and we built everything from those pieces. Okay, so when we talk about carbon dioxide, I don't reference it by a new symbol, carbon dioxide okay, or CD. Okay? How would I reference the symbol for carbon dioxide? CO2. CO2. I'm looking at the component pieces that go into it. So we're doing the same thing with our wheel. Right? But when we look at the CO2, or carbon dioxide, we have some more information there. It's not just carbon and oxygen. I also have the two. What is the two representing? How many oxygens are necessary to go into one carbon dioxide. Okay. That gives me some information on how I could potentially build carbon dioxide. I could take a single carbon and two oxygen atoms, and I could make carbon dioxide. So the formula gives me that information, which allows me to build conversion factors. Same thing can happen with a wheel. Okay. And why pick a wheel? Well, you've seen a wheel. We can point to a wheel. We can't point to a molecule of CO2. We have to imagine that. And that's where things become more difficult, is you're being asked to run manipulations on your imagination. Okay? So that imaginary friend that you had when you were growing up now becomes real, and you have to interact with it. Okay? In the real world, at this age, we would probably put you in an insane asylum. But since we're in a chemistry course, everybody thinks you're brilliant. Okay? So science allows us to be insane because we're using our imagination to make things or predictions about things we can't see. Right? So let's fix our formula. How many rims went into the wheel? One. one. Should I specify the one? Why not? Okay. Is it wrong to write a one there? It's unnecessary. If it's unnecessary and someone starts to write it, does that potentially add confusion? Yeah. So we don't want to go through and specify ones. We only want to put extra numbers in there when that meaning is necessary. How many spokes go into it? Did you actually count it? Is it 24? I was going to say 32. but So we get 24 spokes. Where should we write that 24? I mean, I could write it out here, couldn't I? Okay. That starts to get really confusing. Those things kind of overlap each other. I could write it, because they start to overlap, I could write it really small in front. Okay. Well, which one is it referring to? So again, it comes down to our human invention on what the writing system is. Does it make sense with the location of where it is? Okay. That makes sense is something that we just agreed upon. We could have written 24 in front. But we decided that it made more sense to write it as a subscript afterwards. Why did it make more sense to write it as a subscript afterwards? What did we put in front? 
If I looked at carbon and I wrote this, what does that six mean? Nothing. Six carbon. It doesn't mean nothing. Where is that six written? Directly in front? It's written kind of in front and left and low corner, right? What gets written to the left and low corner? Not a bad idea. Take a look at the periodic table. What's the atomic weight for carbon? It's not six. So I'm not referencing the atomic weight there. What am I referencing? The atomic number. If I wanted to specify the atomic weight, where would I put the atomic weight with this? The upper left corner. This was our atomic notation. Right? Because the atomic notation already took those places, I don't want to place the numerical amount of that atom in one of those spots because now it cross-contaminates those streams, for lack of a better word. Okay? So we're trying to place information in such a way that it is universal and it doesn't get confused with other systems. Kind of make sense? All right. So we now have a formula for how to build a wheel because we have one tire. Okay. That single formula gives me a bunch of information, okay. just like it did for the CO2 underneath. Okay. I know that now to go through and build this, I need one rim, 24 spokes, and one tire. Okay. Set in the mathematical notation, one rim plus 24 spokes. Spokes begins with S, just so you know. S, P, plus one tire equals one wheel. From this expression, we can also pull some other useful pieces of information. I can say that one tire goes into one wheel. Okay. With that information, what could I do? I now have an equality, and what can we do with equalities? Just like you did with the pizza. Okay. I could solve them. I can group the units all on one side of the equation. I can divide both sides by one. Of course, I had to pick. No, I'm not picking that one. Divide both sides by tires. What would I get? What is one tire over one tire? One. One what? It's unitless. There's no units left over. Okay. How many times does one tire d divide into one tire? Once. That's it. There is no unit associated with it. It's just one. What does that equal? One wheel, which in this case we're writing out is the 24. Of course, I left off that P. Why is this now useful? Well, if I want to convert tires into wheels, I have a conversion factor that I can use. That conversion factor, that fraction there, is equal to 1. What happens when I multiply anything by 1? I get the same thing. So I maintain the meaning, but I can now change the unit. For instance, I have 500 tires. How many wheels could I make? Okay. Well, tires and wheels aren't the same thing, right? They aren't. So what do I have to do? I need a conversion. In that conversion factor, what needs to happen? What has to happen to the units of tires? They have to cancel out. What do I want for a unit up top? That big thing, our formula for wheels. What is the numerical relationship between those two? That's what our conversion factor was, one and one. 
in this process, what does that conversion factor equal? One. So I don't change the meaning of 500 tires. I can change the unit, but keep the numerical meaning. That is pretty powerful. That's what our conversion factor is doing. Okay? The units of tires now disappears, and we're left with units of wheels. And I would know using that conversion factor that with 500 tires, I can make 500 wheels. Okay? The conversion factor is literally just one. Every time we do a conversion, we're multiplying by one. Which one are we multiplying by? Okay? For instance, 24 hours equals one day, right? Yeah? Okay. Could I say one equals one day? Over 24 hours. Yeah. Is that one? Yeah. One day over 24 hours. Is that one? Yeah. Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to take 500 tires and multiply it by one day over 24 hours? What is one day over 24 hours? One. Can I multiply anything by one? Yes. Absolutely. Fair game. What does that do for me? What would my units be at the end of that? Time, day, over hours. Not time. Tires. Tires. Times, days, over hours. What does that unit mean? I have no freaking clue. Is that conversion factor a useful conversion? No. I'm still allowed to do it, but it doesn't get me anywhere that I have any meaning behind. So what we're choosing is trying to find a conversion factor that allows us to keep meaning. There are billions of conversion factors. You have to choose one. The one you choose becomes very important. How do you know which one to choose? The first step of all of our conversions, what do we do? We write down the unit we're trying to solve for. The conversion factor we use had better do what? get us closer to that goal. If it doesn't get us closer to that goal, you picked the wrong one out of a billion. Try again. Okay? If you've got a billion things to choose from, that's going to be very problematic and it's going to take you a very long time to solve. If we look at how a computer solves, guess what the computer does? That exact process. Okay? Why do we let a computer do it, but not humans? Okay. The computer can run those multitude of calculations without having to think about things. What can humans do? Think about it and choose the conversion factor that makes sense. Because okay. Greg got really excited. Let's give him a second here. Only because... I, this is the first time I've thought about this, way, but when you're choosing which conversion factor, that's actually a rhetorical choice because you're, you have to, it's not just anything. You have to make a conscious choice about what's most appropriate based on the problem, based on the context. So you're, based on that context, making a, an intentional, you're intentionally focusing or choosing the scope of that problem. It's a, really cool. it's a rhetorical thing based on, yeah, rhetorical decision. That is a horrible rhetorical choice to use days per hour that doesn't take us to a unit or a meaning that is useful for us. Okay? You can still do it. You can still write a paper about elephants that talks about pineapples. Why would you do that? Okay? One's fruit and one's an animal. Good point. Why would you do that? Okay? That's not a rhetorically useful aspect of your writing. Right? So when you put together your conversions, that's what you need to be thinking about. Why am I doing this conversion? 
right? And one of the biggest problems that students go through and do, or biggest shortcuts that students attempt, is they say, well, all I have to do is put the number in the right place. So I'm just going to divide by 24. Was 24 a valid number to put in? It depends on the context. It depends on the units associated with it. Okay? If your reason for doing your mathematic operation is you're like, eh, a number should show up, I'm going to put one in, that's not rhetorically useful. You're literally just typing words into the computer and hoping that you've created Shakespeare. Don't do that. Think about the process behind why you're putting things there. That's the point of the unit work. Okay? So, the equation. We got a couple things on here. The first question, how many atoms of sodium are needed to make one molecule of sodium carbonate? Do I need a chemical equation? No, why not? Because you know the charge of carbonate. And we also need to... What do I need if I don't need a chemical equation? A what? Nomenclature. You would need nomenclature to be able to name... Not a chemical equation, but a chemical... Charge. Formula. The chemical formula for sodium carbonate. Sodium was Na, carbonate is CO3. The charge on carbonate? Minus 2. The charge on sodium? Plus 1. Based off of your rules of nomenclature, you would know that that structure is not balanced. And before we start to answer any questions about it, we have to make sure we're looking at a true statement. How would I fix that to make sure it's a true statement? How? I need two sodiums. So again, we're putting the, the number there in to specify the amount. If I give you one sodium carbonate, how many sodiums were needed to make it? Two. How did you do that? Because it says so. With formulas, it's not a bad argument. It says so. Okay? I'm going to say we need to do better. What are we solving for? Sodium. sodium. What are we starting with? Sodium How many sodium carbonates? One. One sodium carbonate needs to be converted into sodium. How do I do that? Does sodium carbonate show up in the answer? Nope. So what has to happen to that unit? Can you just delete carbonate? No. You could delete sodium carbonate as a unit. What are we trying to convert sodium carbonate into? Sodium. What is the relationship between sodium and sodium carbonate? There are two sodiums found in... One sodium carbonate. Now what happens? The units cancel and we'd be left with sodiums. So what Cody said was, well, it's obvious. It's two sodiums. It's obvious because we started with one thing and we just looked swiftly at the formula. Okay? But if those numbers start changing to other things that aren't obvious to manipulate, you're going to lose track which is why you should be sticking with the process to go through and solve this. Okay? So the formula allows you to convert substances. Okay? What's the next statement? Molecules of sodium carbonate are needed to make molecules of sodium hydrogen carbonate. What are we solving for? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. We're solving for sodium Molecules of, and for the whole visual design aspect, let's make sure that we put it all in one line. Molecules of sodium carbonate. What am I starting with? 
Uh, sodium hydrogen carbonate isn't quite good enough of an answer on what I'm starting with. What am I starting with? I don't accept two. Molecules of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Okay. This is now going to layer in some really important information. Okay. In that last solve where we just looked at the chemical formula, we lost the measurement unit. I'm going to make the argument you should always have a measurement unit. In this case, what is the measurement unit? Molecules. Okay. It's just a counting of molecules. What is the substance? Sodium hydrogen carbonate. Is it becoming important to specify the substance? Why is it important? Remember, this is an equality. What has to happen? As an equality? It has to balance. It has to be the same thing on both sides. This says sodium hydrogen carbonate. What does this say? Sodium carbonate. Do they say the same thing? Did the substance change? Yes. It's going to become very important to specify the substance because your substances will now change. In unit two, the substance was the same all the way through. You didn't have to worry about it. It was only the measurement unit you had to deal with. Now you have to worry about the substance. Right. Well, how do I convert substances? How did I make a wheel? Analyze, it. Analyze what? What what I look at to make a wheel? What were the parts that I needed to make a wheel? Spokes, rim, tire. Okay. So just one of each? No, what did I need? 24 spokes, one rim, one tire. I have to evaluate each of those pieces, each of those substances that goes into it. The same thing is going to happen through here. Okay. To build that wheel, I had to come up with or break apart or analyze the individual pieces. In the analysis of those pieces, what do I then have to also do? If I just have a bunch of pieces, do I have a wheel? No, have I have to put it together, or I have to... It's not like Rick talked about this at all. I, I have to synthesize it. I have to pull apart the information look at what the component pieces were, and then I also have to be able to reverse and put it back. If I've done everything correct, those things should match. Okay? I have to do both analysis and synthesis. Right? That requires looking at a chemical equation. So when I convert substances, what do I need to be looking for? In chemistry, how do we convert substances? How do I make sodium hydrogen carbonate? You combine sodium hydrogen carbonate. I make sodium hydrogen carbonate by starting with sodium hydrogen carbonate. While that is technically a valid answer, no. How do I make sodium hydrogen carbonate? If I started with it, I'm not making it. How do I make sodium hydrogen carbonate? You make carbonate and then you add sodium to it. Okay. But there's, where's the hydrogen? Oh, you need the hydrogen too? You just, uh, you in a room, that's just... Hydrogen. Okay, let's all take a moment. Take a deep breath. Breathe in. Okay, close your eyes. Let's, let's try this. A little, little meditative. Just close your eyes, relax. Deep breath in. And then exhale. And look at the top of the slide. How do I make sodium hydrogen carbonate? Oh, if, if I mix sodium carbonate with water and CO2, I would get sodium hydrogen carbonate in like a chemical equation? That's crazy. Amazing. To be able to come up with the conversion process, I have to know how to make it. To know how to make it, what do I need? A chemical equation. Okay. There are multiple ways that you could make sodium carbonate. 
I, tons of ways. I, could, I make carbonate, and then I make sodium, and then I put them together. Is that how we need to do this one? No. Why not? What am I starting with? Sodium, hydrogen, carbonate. Does that work to find a relationship with sodium and carbonate? No. I have to use the chemical information given. That could be explicitly stated as a chemical equation, or it could be given... It's everybody's favorite, because you guys just did it. In alphabetic text. And you would have to translate that alphabetic text into a chemical equation. Okay? Why do you have to convert it into a chemical equation? I might regret having deleted all my work there. How many sodium carbonates did I need to react? OK, let's try that question again, because that was a bit rough. How many sodium carbonates do I need to react? Whoa! That was a massive change in speed to that answer. How'd you come up with that so fast? Because the visual design of the chemical equation allows you to interpret that information insanely fast. We don't need to do the whole alphabetic language recall. This is why we use visual design to show our chemical expressions. That's pretty cool. Okay? That's why it's there. You have to be going back to it and using that information. If you don't want to use that information, so this, we could put this to a vote. If you don't like the chemical equations, how many of you do not like chemical equations? No one wants to venture that. Don't like them. Okay, so for your test and your test alone, every single reaction will be given in text, alphabetic text. You like that trade? It would take longer. Ah. Uh, if you prefer the alphabetic text, I will absolutely make you a special exam with no, just alphabetic text. Take forever. Okay, we need to build speed somewhere. Okay, some of that has to happen in that equation. We need to be able to see that information. That's why we encode it in that format as opposed to going to the alphabetic text. Okay, you're used to the alphabetic language. That's cool. Okay, you have to learn the chemistry language. Why do you have to learn it? It's speed. It's efficiency. Right? And everybody complains about speed. Why are you testing me with time? Go to your doctor. You're sick, right? You go to the doctor. You sit down at the doctor and say, this is why I'm sick. And they go, okay, that's cool. Come back in three weeks. I'll let you know what's wrong. Are you going to use that doctor again? No. Why not? You're just saying right now that time it should be a factor. You're now using time to say you won't want to use that doctor. Yeah. Is time an important thing? Yes. Okay. And it sucks, but it is. Okay. Why might it be important? 100 years from now, are any of us here? No. Time is important because we run out of it. Well, we might be. So what we need to do is take that into consideration and attempt to solve things as fast as possible. To come up with ways to simplify our solve or our interpretation so that we can get through it faster. Okay? Sometimes that means building an algorithm. How many feet are in 36 inches? Three. How did you do that so fast? No, you didn't just know that. I, well, maybe I've asked it enough that maybe you got it. What did you do mathematically? Divided by 12. Did dividing by 12 get rid of the units? No. Why were you allowed to divide by 12 and still get the correct answer? You've done that conversion so fast or so often that what you've done is started to ignore those units. You've created an algorithm to solve it. That's phenomenal for a single question. When you move out into the real world, into whatever job you're going to do, you will create algorithms for your job. Okay? Why? It saves time. Why do we not teach you algorithms now? Why?
we're trying to set you up for what do you do when you don't have an algorithm, right? You need to be able to create one. If you don't have the logic on how that algorithm was created, you can't create one. And you have to rely on somebody else to solve it for you. What does that mean? I wouldn't go that far. If you have to rely on somebody else to tell you how to do your job, what does that mean? You are expendable. Okay? Anybody can come in and do that job. Okay? Which means, if somebody doesn't like you higher up the food chain, what can they do? Bye. And they can replace you. If you have the skills to be able to say, I know how to interpret things and create these algorithms to speed the process, okay, or even hide how I came up with that algorithm so nobody else knows, you've created a system where now you are a linchpin in whatever system you're working in. It's very hard to fire you because if they fire you, the whole system crumbles. Okay? So what we're trying to do is give you the skills to become a linchpin. Right? Whether or not you are a linchpin in your future careers, that's entirely up to you. Okay? But what we're trying to set you up with is to become that linchpin. That's why we're doing this. We want you to know the process behind how you build things. I think that's kind of neat. It may suck for you, but that's kind of neat. That's the end goal. So, with that in mind, how do we go through and solve this one? Right? What did I want? Molecules of sodium carbonate. What am I starting with? I'm not accepting two. Molecules of sodium hydrogen carbonate. Why not accept the two? Because if we're going into a system where this calculation has to be run multiple times, what are the odds that two is going to change? A lot. So what I want to do is be able to create an algorithm, a system that happens afterwards so that I can manipulate that initial number. So that number on its own isn't important for my creation of this process. Right? It is important to solve this question, so now I can drop that number in. Do molecules of sodium hydrogen carbonate equal molecules of sodium carbonate? No. So what do we need to do? The unit of molecules of sodium hydrogen carbonate must disappear. Should it just disappear? Is that it? No, what do I want to happen? Sodium carbonate on top. I want molecules of sodium carbonate to appear. Well, how am I doing this conversion? How am I converting sodium hydrogen carbonate into sodium carbonate? Where is that information stored? How do I convert the substance? Okay, so we stopped sh just short of the deep breath in and looking at the top from the chemical equation. And when we look at the balanced chemical equation, what number is associated with sodium carbonate? One. One. What number is associated with sodium hydrogen carbonate? Two. Are you asking me or are you telling me? Asking. Okay. Where is sodium hydrogen carbonate in our equation? Right, what is the number associated with sodium hydrogen carbonate? Two. two. Are you asking me or are you telling me? There we go. Two. We now have a process that I can go through and solve. And if I need to run this calculation a whole bunch, what do I just need to do? Change out the numbers. Change out what numbers? The two and the two. Or, well, I guess... The one and the two in the middle here, are, they should both be black. Should I be changing those numbers? No, why not? Those are conversion factors that came from the chemical equation. So if I never change the chemical equation, what happens to those numbers? They stay the same. What numbers could change? The very beginning and the very end. I now have an algorithm. Just like I did with 36 inches becoming 3 feet, I divide by 12. My algorithm is take whatever number I started with and divide by 2. There I am, or multiply by a half. 
Okay? I've created an algorithm to solve this. That's phenomenal. What happens if I change the question? Can I use the algorithm anymore? No, I would have to generate a new one. Right? And so that's what we're working through in this section, is coming up with those processes. Once you know the process, it's the same basic rules. Right? You follow the units and you establish that process. Right? Because we aren't teaching you to do that job, right? we're teaching you to become a linchpin, we want you to be able to do multiple different types of these conversions, different units, different systems. So that's what this whole section is about, is how, what are all those possible units you have access to? Can you prove to me that you can do those types of conversions? Okay? Do you have the process skills? Linchpin, it's the thing that holds everything together. Okay? So you remove the linchpin, everything falls apart. So you look at trains, they have a linchpin that holds the individual cars together. You remove the linchpin, what happens? The cars separate. So if we looked at it as a company, we want to be that linchpin that holds the cars together. Sure. I haven't read. I haven't read or seen Anastasia or Polar Express. I've seen Polar. Well, vaguely. Vaguely. I've seen them. In any case, that's what a linchpin is. Okay? Use that to come up with the process. Tell you what, if you guys score above a 90% on this exam, we will watch Polar Express in, in the chemistry class. Wait, everyone? The average has to be above a 90%. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I would make. I would be ecstatic. I would be a. I would be. I'd bring candy. I'd bring food. I'd bring everything. Okay. Guys. Just saying. So, uh, and of course, I deleted all that stuff back there. What's one of the problems with coming out with a calculation like we just did? Okay, we came up and we got what, one molecule of sodium carbonate. Okay. So to run this, I need one molecule of sodium carbonate. Cool. I now want to go into the lab to make my sodium hydrogen carbonate. I need to measure out one molecule of sodium carbonate. How do I do that? Okay. I can't. What do you mean I can't? Why can't I? A sodium carbonate molecule is insanely tiny. I can't just grab one molecule of it, okay? But I never grab molecules. We've done lots of experiments in the lab, okay? Couldn't I just measure out a volume or a mass? Yeah. What is the precision of those measurements? How many molecules would I be getting out? That's a harder question, okay? So let's take a look at that. I now want to know how many grams of sodium, what do we say, sodium carbonate? I have, if I have one molecule of sodium carbonate. Okay. Okay, molecules. Okay, molecules of sodium carbonate. And I want ideally grams of sodium carbonate. Is that conversion factor or does that conversion factor exist? Yes. Where? Where does it exist? This is relating the mass to a single molecule. Where do we have information about the mass of things? On the periodic table. So I could look at the mass of two sodiums, the mass of one carbon, the mass of three oxygens, and wouldn't I have the mass? Okay. What is the mass, those numbers? Sodium is 23, ballpark. What is the unit on that 23? AMUs. AMUs. Not grams. It's AMUs. Okay. And that would be an AMU for a single atom. If I add them all up, I could go through and do that, and I could instead get AMUs. So we had 23 times 2... 12 plus 48 plus 16 times 3. So what do we have? 46 and 12 is 
58 plus 48, 106. Did I do that right? Okay. So 106. 106 what? AMUs. It's the mass measurement. So it's 106 AMUs for one molecule of sodium carbonate. Is AMUs the same thing as grams? No. So what do I have to do? I have to do a conversion. In that conversion, what do I need to get rid of? AMU, and what do I want? Grams. Okay, again, the substance, sodium carbonate. Does anybody know that conversion factor? 6.022 times. No. Nice try. That conversion factor is found actually on the front of your exam. There are 1.661 times 10 to the negative 24th grams in one AMU. Okay. So uh, what is that? 10 to the second. So ballpark our mass for that one molecule is somewhere on the order of 10 to the negative 22. Ish, right? We okay with that? Okay. So that is roughly this number. Zero point give or take one or two zeros. Grams of sodium carbonate. We've all used our balances. What are our balances precise to? I know that lab was a long time ago. Our balances will measure zero, zero, one. Could be wrong. Pretty sure our balance can't measure that zero. Well, we just need a more precise balance. Because when you move up to 151 or officially 152, you move into a different lab room, and that different lab room has more precise balances. Okay, it does. Okay, because you're doing more precise things, so we give you a better balance. Those balances measure 0 0.0001 at a cost of an extra $500. I have a lot more zeros to cover to be able to measure out that one molecule I'm looking at a balance and just assuming linearity okay, which is horribly wrong it's more like an exponential function and we can talk about mathematics later if you want okay. I'm looking at a, a balance that costs 50, 60 grand maybe I might have that number a bit on the low end, right? Because each zero is another $500. So if we just said this one was started at $0, which doesn't make any sense, but then 500 for an extra zero. So 500, uh, and we've got, what, 18 more zeros. So 500 times 18. I don't have a calculator. Oh, it's only 9,000? That doesn't sound right. 500 times 18, not 18 zeros, like 10 yeah. 18? No, 500 times 18. Yeah, it's 9, 9, oh, it is 9,000? There you go. $9,000 for a single balance to potentially measure that. Okay. When you consider equipment, that's actually not bad, but that's, again, assuming linearity. That's assuming only $500 for each step. Okay. The next step for the next sig fig, I think, drops to like two or three grand more. Yeah, it's not linear. It doesn't go up by 500 each time. Okay? That's kind of a pain. Okay? And that's in the modern age. Remember, when most of these things were discovered, 1800s, how the hell did they do anything in the 1800s? Okay? That doesn't make any sense. How could they possibly do this? Okay? Well, they said it is 
dumb to measure a molecule. It is outside of the realm of feasibility. I'm not going to measure one molecule. I'm going to measure the mass of two molecules. Right? So now instead of it being 10 to the negative 22, it is 2 times 10 to the negative 22. Better, but that didn't do much. So I'm going to do 10 molecules. So now it will be 1 times 10 to the negative 21. I'm getting better. Right? That number is getting a little bit less astronomically tiny. Right? So how many molecules should I measure to make that power of 10 effectively disappear? You should be able to give me a specific numerical value. How many molecules? Where did the power of 10 come from? Did the power of 10 show up in the red number here? No. Did it show up in these purple numbers? Did it show up in these purple numbers? Yeah. yeah. So that power of 10, that nasty. I don't want that anymore. How do I cancel out 10 to the negative 24? Multiply by 10 to the 24. So instead of being one molecule, when I measure out molecules, I'm going to measure out on the order of 10 to the 24th molecules. When I measure out that many molecules, that now negates this and it puts me in a mass range that is reasonable for me to measure. In this case, we're looking at somewhere like 100 grams. Okay. I picked an arbitrary number, but that arbitrary number's goal was to get rid of this power of 10. Okay. And it could literally be anything, any number I want. Okay. The next part that is beautiful about Avogadro's number is that we didn't pick just a number to cancel the 10 to the 24. Okay. I picked a number that entirely cancels the gram to AMU conversion. If that conversion disappears, what does my answer become? If I want to now know how many grams for my sodium hydrogen or my sodium carbonate. 106. 106. That takes this number that I got off the periodic table, this 106 AMUs per one molecule, and it makes it 106 grams for whatever that new unit I've invented. I want to come up with a name for that new unit that describes that massive number of particles. What name do I choose? Bob. Uh, my best friend was named Bob. I didn't, well, if he's my best friend, I probably actually liked him. Bob was my enemy. I didn't like Bob. I don't want to call it Bob. Okay. Andrew was already taken, so I picked Mole. I can now take the number on the periodic table, and instead of referencing it as AMUs, a mass unit I can't measure, and would have to do this nasty gram AMU conversion for, and make that grams for that now massive number of particles, moles. So grams per mole. That means I don't have to do any weird conversions with the mass off the periodic table. It immediately gives me units of grams per mole instead of AMUs per molecule. That's insanely powerful because that means no more conversions. Okay? So I need a conversion factor that completely eliminates this. How could I completely eliminate this number? Sixty-two. How do I make sixty-two disappear? Okay. I heard an add or subtract. The add or subtract doesn't work because in our conversions, what are we doing? Multiplication and division. So how can I get my 62 to disappear? Multiply by the reciprocal. 1 over 62. Okay. So what am I trying to do? I want this nasty, ugly mass conversion factor to disappear. And it's going to disappear because I'm now going to measure out that specific number of molecules. So I'm defining a new unit. That new unit, okay, I'm going to say I have some number of molecules will equal one mole okay, of those same molecules. Okay. The number I pick needs to be the reciprocal of this. 
Okay? So the number I'm going to pick here will be 1, come on, pen, 1 over 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th molecules. That looks kind of ugly, and that doesn't look like any numbers we've seen before. Somebody's got a calculator. What is 1 divided by 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24? What is it? didn't divide by 10 to the negative 24. You kept it in the numerator. You do the calculation, it comes out to be 6.024 times 10 to the 23rd molecules is equal to 1 mole. The arbitrary unit, the arbitrary number that I picked of molecules so that this conversion gets me a mass that makes sense is 6.022 times 10 to the 24th molecules. We'll ignore the 4 for the moment because it comes to sig figs. Okay? I'm now defining a new measurement. I'm defining moles. Okay? The reason I pick that number is that this mass converter here entirely disappears, and now when I interpret the periodic table, I can use for copper 63.55 grams per mole don't have to use AMUs. This allows me to now use a measurable amount. When I go into the lab, I can measure gram quantities pretty easily. Those gram quantities will now be massive amounts of molecules, but each of those molecules, I'm making the assumption, will follow the chemical expression. And they will do what the chemistry says it should happen. All right? This is what a mole is. Right? It does not have to be atoms. It does not have to be molecules. Okay. If I asked you to go to the store and buy a dozen, what are you buying? I said, what are you buying? Not how many. Okay. It wasn't very clear, right? A dozen is just the number 12. If I asked you to buy a dozen eggs, you're buying 12 eggs. Okay? Same thing is happening with our mole. This is items. Okay? This is a physical thing. Okay? Atoms are items. Molecules are items. Grams. Shaking your head. Good. What are grams? Not an item. Not an item. What are grams? They're a measurement. Okay? When we're looking at a mole, it's only about items. And people will try and use grams and will say, well, isn't this true? The statement is true, but you have to be a little bit careful with it. When we're saying 1 mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd grams, what we're saying is that when I take 1 mole of an object that weighs 1 gram, there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of those objects that happen to weigh 1 gram. The mass is a secondary feature of that. Okay? It has nothing to do with the conversion factor. Okay? And I bring that up because people like to use it, and you can't. Okay? The biggest thing to deal with it is you're measuring items, a physical object, not a measurement. Okay? So if we looked at how many oxygen atoms were in 0 0.240 moles of O2, Right. We set up a conversion like this before, so we could go through and set this up. What is the item in this case? Okay. Atoms of oxygen. Okay. What are we given as far as moles? 0 0.240 moles of O2. How do I go from 1 mole to 0 0.240? How 
How do I make 1 equal to 0 0.240? Multiply it by 0.240. All right, times by 0 0.240. Well, if I times that side by 0 0.240, what should I do to the other side? Do the exact same thing, 0 0.240. Right? So a point two four zero times six point oh two two, and I now have an answer. Is that the correct answer? Right. When we're talking about moles, a mole is the same item. If I ask you to go to the store and buy a dozen eggs, and you buy me a dozen cookies, that doesn't work. Yes, they're both a dozen. Those are entirely different substances. Right. It's a mole of molecules of O2 is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of O2. What is the problem, or sorry, with our solve? Yeah. You're looking for atoms. We're looking for atoms of oxygen. So while we could do this conversion in this setup, we can't actually solve for the atoms of oxygen right away. All we'd be able to solve for would be the molecules of O2. Okay, So I would take my 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd times by 24, and that would get me a number that I could put in here, whatever that number is. But that's not the answer I want. What's the answer I want? Okay, I want atoms of oxygen. Okay, So what is the conversion factor between atoms of oxygen to molecules of O2. What is the relationship between those? What do you mean? Two atoms of oxygen for each molecule. How do you know there's two atoms of oxygen and one molecule of O2? Because that is some weird stuff you're pulling. Because it says it right there. <laughs> do me one better than it says it right there. Okay, it says atoms of O and molecules of O2. When you look at the chemical formula for molecules of oxygen, what is it? O2, meaning there are two atoms of oxygen in one molecule of O2. Okay. To get molecules of O2, whatever that number is to become one molecule, what would you have to multiply by? whatever that weird number scriggly was, okay? Which means, how, oh, darn it, I can't get it in that. See, this is a new format that I'm not used to. We're trying to convert this weird squiggly, molecules of O2 into atoms of oxygen. I need to know what that is. How do I make 1 equal to that weird squiggly? How do I make 1 equal to a weird squiggly? Uh, multiply it by a weird squiggly. Multiply it by a weird squiggly. So what do I have to do to the other side? Multiply by a weird squiggly. Okay. Conversion step, conversion step. This is multiple conversions, multiple lines, multiple different systems moving through it. Okay. It works. You're allowed to do that if you want. I find it confusing. Okay? And if you want to move through the single step conversions, we can do that. We can talk about it outside of class. Okay? But let's get back to our fashion. What am I solving for? Okay. Our atoms of oxygen, what am I given? No, zero is not correct. What am I given? Point is incorrect. What am I given? Mole. Mole. Also incorrect, but better. Mole of oxygen. What is the numerical value associated to that unit? 0 0.24. Those of you saying, well, I said 0. Point. I know you did. You started with the numerical value. I don't want the numerical value. I want the unit first. The unit dictates how your work goes. Focus on that unit. Is moles of O2 the same thing as atoms of O? So what do you need to do? Okay. I have to multiply by 1. 
Which one do I use? Moles of O2, what do I want to convert it to? Okay, ideally atoms of O. Is there a valid conversion factor for that? Okay, no, and you say it questionably. Well, isn't it just two atoms and one mole of O2? What is a mole? So one times mole would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Is, are there two atoms in 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of O2? No. Okay. Those numbers don't make sense. Okay. When you're thinking 2 to 1, what are you converting to? Not moles. What O2? What's the measurement unit? Molecules. Okay. So you've established that the substance has changed. So you decided to go through and deal with the substance conversion. Okay. Perfectly all right. The issue with using this substance conversion, what happened to your units? Are moles the same thing as um, molecules? No. No. What happens to your units? I heard it shouted out at the far left. It was... Cancel. Nothing cancels. It's not a wrong conversion, but it doesn't simplify anything. Okay? If you are comfortable introducing that conversion factor now, that's quite all right. If you aren't, then there would be another conversion factor that you would need to include. What conversion factor should that be? We can cheat and use the one that's already there. Does molecules of O2 show up in the answer? No. So where does molecules of O2 as a unit need to show up? Why on top? So that those units would cancel. What other unit do I need to cancel? Moles of what? Okay. So that those units would cancel. What is the relationship between molecules and moles? What are molecules? What are molecules? They're an item. Right? They're a physical object. What number goes in front of molecules? How do you know 6.022? When we look at our items from our equality, what number shows up in front of items? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. What shows up in front of moles? One. Okay. I know it was a little while ago, but in our conversion through, what did we have to do with our 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd? We had to multiply. Okay. In that longer step process, we had to multiply by that. We ended up also multiplying by 2. The conversions line up. They match with that other process. Okay. Both processes work. This one organizes it very swiftly, and it r reduces the amount of redundant information. Okay. When trying to solve a question fast, do you want redundant information? No, we want it as simple as possible. That's the process of our units. Kind of make sense? Okay. The big lesson from moles is that your periodic table now tells you molar mass as opposed to atomic mass. Okay. And that's the one we solved through with our sodium carbonate. Okay. That's pretty insanely cool. So the mass on our periodic table can be AMUs. It can also be... Mass in, ends with a G, grams per mole, hence molar mass. Okay? So, what is the molar mass of copper 2 nitrite? Should we make it more difficult? Let's say no. Go ahead, solve. What is the molar mass for copper 2 nitrite? This one isn't as big a deal. 
Where do we find molar mass? Two people immediately started trying to solve, which was good. Where were they looking? To the periodic table. The molar mass is literally on the periodic table. So what would you look up? You looked up the molar mass for copper. What was it? Fair enough. 63.55 or 29? The 63.55. Nitrogen. When we look at nitrogen, it says 14.01. Why are you multiplying by 2? How do you know there's two of them? This 2 applies to the parentheses. Nitrogen is within those parentheses, so there's two nitrogens. Plus oxygen, 16, just times 2, right? Is it the 2? Y times 4. I have the purple 2 and the blue 2, which means 4. I can add it up, and I get the magic number of... 155.57 units. AMUs is not a molar mass. AMUs would be an atomic mass. That's for a single molecule. I'm asking for the molar mass, so AMUs is now wrong. Grams of copper 2 nitrite. Is that it? Wrong. Right now, all you have is a mass, where you asked to solve for a mass. What would you just mouth? Yes. You were asked to solve for a molar mass. So right now, you are wrong, because all you have solved for is a mass. What does the periodic table give you? The molar mass. How do I make that measurement? Now a molar mass. You just left the unit off. Okay. One mole of copper 2 nitrite equals 155.57 grams of copper 2 nitrite. That's what it gives you. Right. For those of you being like, well, that was kind of silly just to do that addition, I didn't really need to write any notes. What is the mass in grams of 0.532 moles of copper 2 nitrite? What are you being asked to solve for? Mass in grams. Of what? Grams of copper 2 nitrite. Is this per mole anymore? No. no, this says specifically mass in grams. Does it say molar mass? No, because we aren't solving for the molar mass. You're solving for the mass in grams. What are you given to start with? 0 0.532 moles of copper nitrite. Are those units the same? No. Is the substance the same? Cool. So all we have to do is convert the measurement unit. What measurement unit am I converting? What do you want? Where do you want grams? Grams of what? Cool. If I did that calculation, would it work? Why not? I didn't cancel out moles, so what do I need? Where do I find that information relating the mass to moles of a substance? That would be the periodic table. That would be the exact last question, which if you wrote down the notes, you'd be able to write down that number and you could solve this question. If you didn't write down the notes, you have to do that question all over again.
What is the mass in grams of 2.55 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of lead? Oh my god, powers of 10. Yep. Mass in grams, 2.55 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of lead. Looking at the periodic table isn't a horrible idea, but you're probably not going to be able to do that calculation in your head. What do you need to do? Okay. Everybody should know exactly where to start. Because we've started at this exact same space every single time. What are you solving for? Grams of lead. So for people not writing down any notes, because they're like, God, this is going over my head. This process has not changed. You need to be writing those initial steps. If you do not know those initial steps by now, you've got a lot of work ready to go in the next four weeks. What are we given to start with? No. Thank you. And of course, I didn't give myself enough space. Atoms of lead. I remember, it's the units that drive your soul. That's how you have to keep this focus. Okay. What is the number associated with those units? Now we can go back to the 2.55 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. Are atoms of lead the same thing as grams of lead? No. So what do we have to do? We have to convert. Ideally, atoms of lead would show up on the bottom, and we'd get what on the top? Grams, Grams of lead. Do we have the mass related to a single atom anywhere? Yes. No. Where? Okay. What units? In AMUs. Okay. So we the periodic table does tell us the mass of a single atom in units of AMUs. So we could go through and start this with AMUs. Okay. Which does work, believe it or not, and we'll go through and solve this one quickly. We get 207.2 .2 AMUs is one atom of lead. Okay. Atoms of lead cancel. AMUs of lead, what do I want on top? Grams of lead. You are not required to memorize that, but it's also given to you on the front of the exam. And you were told that it is... 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th grams is 1 AMU. What units would you now have? Grams of lead. You run that calculation, guess what you have? The correct answer. Okay, because of time, I'm not doing this one quite in the same order. 23rd. What do I want for an answer? Yep, grams of lead. Okay. That whole atom to AMU, man, grams, I don't like AMUs. Those things are just confusing. I don't know what to do with them. So instead, I'm going to convert to moles of lead. What is the conversion factor between atoms and moles? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Atoms are our item. So our 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd goes on the bottom, one mole on top. How do I convert moles of lead into grams of lead? Where do I find grams per mole? The periodic table. 207.2 grams was one mole. The moles of lead cancel. What would I be left with? Grams of lead. Are all those numbers exactly the same? No. That seems kind of bizarre. What was the whole point of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd? 
to entirely cancel 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24, they're reciprocals of each other, which means done the exact same calculation. They will cancel each other out. So either way you do it works to get to your grams of lead. Right? We will be doing constantly conversions for pretty much the rest of this unit. Right? And it's going to scaffold very quickly. Right? So you need to be practicing these things now.